It is a distinct pleasure to be here today uh, as part of the Wertheim Lecture Series. Dr. Bert Wertheim is a, a name you see many places on this campus. He's a very, very successful entrepreneur, businessman, and physician. Uh, and he was so kind to bless uh, the college funding to support this speaker series. And we have frequent speakers under this program. But we are particularly blessed today to have someone that is an extremely successful business person that has also some significant insights on critical social issues. And I think the combination of the two is, is extremely important. <laughs> David Rucker has a long history in the finance industry. He was the founding partner of a hedge fund called Rucker Partners um, that he ran that firm for almost 20 years. Very, very successful firm. Um, in the 2007, 2006 area, he decided to retire. Uh, now that doesn't mean that he's not working anymore. <laughs> he keeps a very, very busy schedule between his residency in Florida on Key Biscayne uh, and, a, and a beautiful home in New Jersey. Um, where they had the distinct pleasure of playing that uh, highly competitive Super Bowl game. <laughs> they, they, uh, I heard this uh, thing this morning on, uh, on the sports radio about the Super Bowl game, but I'll pass on that because there may be some Denver fans in here. <laughs> David is a graduate twice of Harvard University. He has an undergraduate degree from Harvard College and a Master's of Business from the Harvard Business School. He also is a veteran. He served in the United States Navy. And he has been extremely active uh, in many uh, very, very important charitable organizations. So he brings today a significant experience in the investment community, where he was very successful. Also within uh, many issues that are in touch his heart um, that are important to our country and to our society. Please give a warm FIU welcome to David.
the immigrants to this country struggled, but they had the initiative, they took risks, they worked hard, and these are the characteristics that breed success. And they sacrificed so that their children and grandchildren would have a better life. So there's much to admire about America and much to criticize, and I will do both. But it's still important to recognize that America is the greatest country in the world. Uh, this is not a genuine slogan, it's a fact. Uh, there's an easy way to evaluate success of countries. It's whether people are trying to get in or get out. And we have immigration laws, I'm not going to go into politics on that issue, but it is clear that people want to come to this country for a lot of positive reasons. And it is clear that the, many of the countries that have professed to focus on equality, typically communist countries, you could be the judge yourself. You had East Germany, where people were trying to flee East Germany. Russia, where people were trying to flee Russia. Russia's a kleptocracy, and the capital is fleeing out of there, $80 billion a year from the oligarchs and Putin and his friends are leaving and the families of the Russian leaders are, are largely being sent overseas. Um, we've got North Korea, which enslaves millions of its own people. Uh, Cuba, with a tremendously productive uh, and innovative people, is constantly in need of aid from other people, restricts immigration from there. These are places that are supposed to be for the people, but they won't let the people out. Here, people want to come. So they're very positive kinds of things. Um, however, things must change. Things do change. Uh, sometimes for the better. In my lifetime, most of the positive changes have been in the social arena. Uh, with much better racial tolerance than as I was growing up. Gender equality is a long way to go, but it's going in the right direction. Sexual preferences uh, are respected. The crime rates are going down. All those, those things are very positive. Uh, economically, I'm afraid things are going in the, in the other direction. That's going to be the subject of much of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we've gone from being a creditor nation to the world to being a large debtor nation. Our political system is completely broken, and popular, government, popular confidence in the government is at an all-time low. 90% of the people think that Congress is doing a bad job. Congressmen, when elected, spend between 40 and 70% of their time by actual count raising money rather than governing. Our tax code is broken. At 5,600 pages, it's the largest in the world, and it is the most corrupt. And it is no less corrupt than handing out $100 bills and envelopes under bridges. If we have four or five different tax brackets, why do we need 5,600 pages? Think about it. It's all special deals. It's a Christmas turkey stuffed with deals for the people who are the donors that these congressmen are out there seeking. That has to change. Harvard Business School did a study in, uh, you know, if you're trying to, everybody talks about jobs. How do we get more jobs in America? Well, the easiest way to figure out that would be to talk to people who create jobs, hire them. So Harvard Business School did a study, and they try to analyze what would make people come to the United States, and what would deter them from coming to the United States? And the biggest you know, positives is you can make us, or obviously make a stable legal system, the economic opportunity of a large market, the freedoms, the personal freedoms that you have, etc. The negatives tended to be a totally broken and non-functional federal government, a corrupt tax system, too many regulations, and a failing K through 12 educational system. So if we're going to talk about jobs, programs, and how do we fix it, and how do we make America better, unless we deal with those things, all we're doing is short-term fixes. And the, um, I think we're not doing a very good job about that, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, the, the regulations that we have are far too many and, and are ridiculous. If you think of um, when you go to a hospital, you have to fill out a form that uh, you know, gives them approval to, to treat you. I ask people at, at hospitals how many people read them, the answer is zero. Because you know you won't be treated unless you do that. <clears throat> when you sign up for an app on your computer, uh, and they say, do you accept them? Everybody just checks, uh, except they have no idea what they're, what they're checking. All this stuff is just legalistic clutter that needs to change. Prospectuses 
aren't, aren't uh, detailed enough to make an intelligent decision. You've got Privacy Act things filling your news box. Well, this is just helps the legal community create work and, and increases costs for business and it's not helpful. In any case, um, I will, it's very important to listen to people when they speak and understand their biases. What is it that's making them speak this way? What are they selling? What are they trying to convince me to do? To develop effective filters to, to make a judgment. So my objective here, I have no, I'm retired. I have no economic interest in this other than seeing America being a better place for you and for my children and my grandchildren. That's my bias. Uh, and so I want to spend a little time you know, talking about that. We just had an interesting confluence of two events. We've had a State of the Union where we watched the President of the United States tell everybody, as he necessarily must as the leader of the country, how wonderful things are and, and listen the achievements. And a Congress which has been able to achieve very little, standing up and applauding raucously during that period of time. It's quite a show. It's like trained seals. <laughs> <laughs> the same day that that occurred, there was a poll released by the Wall Street Journal and NBC News where they polled Americans to see how they felt about America. And as you get, this is going to total more than 100% because as you can see from the left, what one or two words best describes the state of the union. So you had some people who said more than two, so it's 130%. But if you look at the top ones, it's divided, it's troubled, it's deteriorating. Okay. Those are three negative things, the most important things that they said at the same time. <clears throat> the, it's recovering is 19%, broken 14%, <laughs> hopeful 13%, strong 3%. So there's a very negative view by the actual people of the United States. It was also, uh, I'd like to refer to a, an article by Peggy Noonan, a journalist from the Wall Street Journal, in this week's uh, uh, weekend edition. Um, and I think it was something that made the title was something like that. Meanwhile, back in America. And I talked about the divorce between Washington and the rest of the country. The rest <clears throat> in Washington, Obama is kind of 81% favorable relationship. This is by the way not a political talk, it's just I voted for him twice. 81%. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the country below 50%. It shows the, the, the separation between Washington and the rest of the people. The reason Washington likes him is because he's feeding Washington very well. It's the richest city in the city now, in the country now, the regions around it, and it's loaded with lawyers and lobbyists who are building the American nation a lot. So, <coughs> despite the government that has steadily grown in size, there was a massive loss of confidence the government's ability to solve our problems. As I mentioned, 90% of Americans think that Congress is doing a bad job. Campaign financing is out of control. Sorry for the typo. <laughs> um, in terms of campaign financing, think of it for a moment. You voted be either Romney or Obama. Do you ever ask the question, how did it become Romney? How did it become Obama? I'm sure many of you have access or like to look at TED.com, and I encourage you to look at a, a, a lecture given by uh, Larry Lessig a Harvard law professor uh, who wrote a book called Republic Lost and What We Must Do to Get It Back. He talked about the importance of campaign financing. The money, he said the general election, which I discussed, and there's the money election. And the decision, the Citizens United case, decided by the Supreme Court, that corporations were people, which allowed unlimited resources in two different parties is in Sandra Day O'Connor's where the worst decision the Supreme Court has ever had in that. As a result, you have you hear frequently the discussion about the one percent in America versus the rest of America. We have three hundred fifteen million people, so over three million people. How many people do you think give gave sixty to seventy percent of the total super PAC money? The answer is one hundred and thirty-four. 1% is 3 million people, 134 people gave the school back money. Think of how much control they have over our future. I can't say. There's a political unwillingness to deal with special interest groups. If, <clears throat> if uh, all this money is being solicited by a congressman to run for the next election, 
Who do you think they're getting it from? And what do you think the donors want for that? And as a result, the congressmen do not uh, vote independently for the benefit of the United States. They are beholden to those whom they, uh, from whom they have solicited funds. Kicking the can down the road. This is something that you've seen in this expression many of the times, and this is something that's particularly relevant to, to, to you as youth, because we have taken, in a typical, let's put things in a family budget, and you have a context. If you had, in your home, you had a choice of how much you're going to spend on food, a car, a house, vacations, what have you, but you have finite resources, and you have to make choices. I'm going to spend more on this and less on that, et cetera. In the United States, what we've done is, I like that, 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 we'll take them all, and we will find a way to finance it by borrowing from the future. Well, guess who's back that that funding is going to be done? You. And that's why I'm here to try to galvanize you to wake up and recognize that this is what's happening. We are deferring all these liabilities. This is like if you went to a bar, somebody at the bar said to you, uh, or at a restaurant and says, free drinks for everybody. And you think, this guy's a terrific guy. And then you go home at the end of the month and you see there's a bill on your credit card. You just put it on your credit card. It hasn't changed it. We have different kind of accounting for corporate for, uh, businesses that we have for governments. The government says cash basis accounting. If you spend $100, you put $100. You spend $60 and borrow and put $40 in a future liability for some future thing, you can show that you only spent $60. So the budgets that are reported, as bad as they are, vastly understate the liabilities undertaken. And you are going to be facing that. Um, how did this happen? You know, it's, it's kind of until something happens on an emergency basis, people are kind of, you know, they have busy lives, things are going on. It's understandable. Uh, but it's hard to do that. Um, and so there's a passivity. There's this old joke about a guy, you know, two guys working on a, lab, you know, on a building scaffolding, one guy loses his footing, and as he's falling past his partner in the lower floor, he yells to him, he says, my God, how's it going? He says, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, well, you kind of know the outcome of this kind of policy, but if you don't respond to it in a timely way, you know what are the consequences. Let, I want to quickly go through a couple of things that demonstrate the magnitude of this issue. In 1960, these social security system, you had <clears throat> five people supporting every retiree. By 2009, only three workers were available to support one retiree, me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 20, 30, only 2.2 will be around that. So think of how much harder each person is going to have to work to support the retirees. This is just math. There's no special deal here. That means all the people in the future are going to have to be carrying a bigger burden. So that, <clears throat> all these things are good things. Nobody, you know, everybody wants health care. Everybody wants, uh, you know, benefits to education. Everybody wants police. Everybody wants military. All of these kinds of things. Um, but it's important to understand and to do the math and know what's involved here. As you can see, you know, uh, let me see if I can find it in the corner here. You know, what's happening here is this thing is just growing as in time. And these things are going to be great burdens that will be difficult to come from. If you look at the recent tragedies like Greece and Spain and Italy, whatever, in, in the sense of what's happened to the bond markets, everything is okay until it's not okay. Things happen suddenly. Unless you prepare for them, but by the time it happens, it's too late. America has been blessed by having a currency which is accepted as a reserve currency. So we, there used to be another reserve currency called British pound, but we replaced that. The Chinese are doing everything in their power and to undermine the United States currency. And unless we get our act together, we're going to face that issue in your business lifetimes and, and perhaps early in your business lifetimes. And so, it, so no one is willing to take on these issues, but they're critical to do. Um, I'm sorry. This is hard to read. I'm sorry. I try to expand it, but everybody wants somebody else to pay the bill. If you take a look at tax reform, which is something that's critical and one of the things that was the reason that restricted people from coming here, these are what they call tax expenditures up here uh, on the top. 
This is, uh, I don't know, here. Eliminates the tax deduction. And, and this is how difficult it is to do. Employer provided health for that. $215 billion. A lot of people were getting that benefit where they're having $15,000 paid for their family's health care a year where they're not being taxed. Well, Joe Smith is working at the local hardware store and pays for his health care out of pocket. But these people are really do not want you to change that. Mortgage interest. You know, 60 million households in America don't want to give that up. So before you go all the way go down here, capital gains, state local taxes, charities, what have you. But you can see how difficult it is, and therefore why, in my opinion, the only way this is ever going to change is if you have just a massive restructuring. Just take the, the 5,600 page tax code and make it a 50 page tax code. And just, just clean, it, clean out the, the, the stables. But it's going to need a willingness for everybody to do their burden and sacrifice, which is something the American people have been a little reluctant to do. You know, John Kennedy said, uh, ask not what America can do for you, but what you can do for America. Uh, and the uh, federal spending since that time is up tenfold. So Americans are pretty good about taking, giving, us. Uh, what are the consequences of this? As you can see, this chart is going asymptotically. For a long period of time, you know, debt levels were pretty stable. All of a sudden, enormous. And by the way, the difference between public and private debt, and that gap is yawning, is debt owned by us to foreign entities which gives them a great deal of leverage, which the Greeks have learned. This, this is uh, less important, but whatever, you just get a sense of it. So what's the real world in that? How does the world work? Economic power leads to political power, which gives favors to the people who gave that to it, which creates more economic power. Campaign financing I've already talked about. Lobbying has never been worse than it is right now. K Street is flourishing. And there are articles all around about how easy it is to leave Congress and get five times or 10 times your income going to work for a lobbying entity in the very field that you were regulating. You want to take a look at the heads of the SEC, which was, I mean, I was in the investment business. They've all been the law firms defending the same guys that were prosecuting before. <laughs> Give me a break. <clears throat> Political power is the tax code, which we talked about a little bit. Regulations, too many. And it's not that we have too many, it's that they're not enforced. We don't need more of them. Gerrymandering uh, to get districts which are safe districts. This is a blessing of both Republicans and the Democrats. And it means that the prospects for getting truly independent thought in this country is diminishing. And then you've got the manipulation by the media. The media has its own agenda. The media talks about certain things that it likes, doesn't talk about other things that it likes. Uh, when I get to the point about health care, You'll see the tremendous amount of spending that's being done by the drug industry. And if you take a look at your television, it'll take long before you see an ad by some drug company that's telling about some drug that will make your life better. If it doesn't, you know, it's usually like, this is good for healthy breathing. On the other hand, you could lose a leg or you could lose a leg. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's all these lawyer stuff that, you know, it's all cover your butt, you know, kinds of decisions. So this arrangement, had, this is, we get to the crux of things here, has been very detrimental to the long-term interests of the young. The seniors at the AARP, I got guys at the AARP up there negotiating for me every day, in every congressman's office. We want more of this, we want to cover that, we don't want to give this back, etc. cetera. Uh, we get it from Social Security, where people put in, are getting back uh, about twice as much as they put in. Medicare, where it's almost three times as much as they put in during their lifetime. And uh, these are great deals for, uh, for the seniors, and it's financed by debt that will be burdening your generation. Who do you have? I've got the ARP. Who do you have? Corporations and lobbyists, who do you have? Federal bailout and debt forgiveness without limitations. We had a big bailout of bail an economy that went in the toilet because the bankers did crazy stuff. Uh, part of Big part of my message is to ever get this thing changed, you have to have four letters, skin in the game. You have to be at risk. I mean, Goldman Sachs was a private partnership, and, uh, and people had to uh, have their entire balance sheets exposed to rich, uh, to risk. I'm sorry. Um, they were leveraged six to one. It became a limited liability corporation. It became leveraged thirty-five to one. The upside downside completely changed. 
Federal Reserve has not done anything other than take away an issue called moral hazard, because every time something is, is excessive, they do nothing. You have a catastrophe where there's long-term capital management, foreign markets go down because of you know, Russian debt or, or what have you, uh, a, a mortgage crisis, uh, a, a crisis in, in the stock market caused by the oh, collapse of the dot-com bubble. As soon as those things happen, they ease. And so people feel they have what they call the Fed put. You know, I can take all the risk because if things go bad, the Fed will bail me out. Until there's risk that is worn by you, until there's skin in the game, and things are structured in that fashion, that will never change. The banks, the government came in after the crash and said, my God, these banks are a disaster. We have to restore the banking system. They cut interest rates to zero. Because if your product went to zero, you'd make a lot of money. You were in the if you're furniture business and they made wood zero, you'd make a lot of money. But they put no restrictions on what the bankers could get paid when they did make the money. And so now the bankers are, you know, it's the old story of a, of a guy who was born on third base and thought he'd get a triple. You know, so, so, so the, the bankers are getting big bonuses right now because all this money is now being made because they have no interest costs or very low interest costs. The also, also the problem has been, as each of these crises that I previously enumerated occurred, the rate cuts have come from ever higher levels. We've been in a bull market in bonds since 1982. If we had another crisis, where are we going to cut from zero? You know, you know what you're getting on your bank deposits. This has been a, a, a deal of benefit to the bankers at the expense of seniors, uh, uh, fixed incomes, and savers. They used to say if you had a million dollars, you could retire. If you get a million dollars in the bank today, you know how much you make? Two thousand dollars a year. You want to retire on that? Have a nice time. Meanwhile, the interest rate was lowered for bankers, not for student loans. No constituency. You need to have somebody there. This is a very hard chart to read. Uh, sorry, but I don't think it just reproduces well. well and it's something that gives you an idea of the medical issue. It was a wonderful article. In Time Magazine, I think it was March last year, with a picture of a big, like an aspirin like pill on the cover, and the title of it was Bitter, Bitter Pill. This is the biggest item in our economy. We spend $2.8 trillion a year on medical costs. The expectation is that we spend $750 billion more than necessary. It's just waste. We have one of the deal, just this, you forget reading, I'll just read it to you. Uh, just to give you an idea, an appendectomy in the United States is thirteen thousand dollars. In Canada, it's five thousand. In Australia, it's five thousand. In Chile, it's five thousand. In France, it's three thousand. Germany, it's three thousand. This is uh, for coronary bypass in the United States, sixty-seven thousand. In France, it's sixteen thousand. In Germany, it's sixteen thousand. Canada's forty thousand. Australia's thirty-four thousand. Obamacare doesn't deal with these costs. Obamacare deals with financing these costs. Our medical costs are 19% of our GDP. The average medical costs of other developed nations, Canada, France, Switzerland, Germany, is 11. We have to compete with them in an ever increasingly unified and competitive world. You cannot overcome anything that big without being more intelligent. And, there, and then we get to the deals. How can we, you know, how can we, where are the big issues? Where do we say them? First of all, why is this happening? We have $5.6, $5.3 billion spent in lobbying Congress, which people worry about the military industrial complex. We have a medical industrial complex. That's military lobby. That's medical lobby. <clears throat> where can we save the money? This is Stephen Brill, who's the author of this uh, article. We pay in, in drug prices. The, go the government made Medicare, the biggest buyer of drugs in the world, unable to negotiate drug prices with drug companies. That was part of the deal to get them to support the Affordable Care Act, which is not affordable. Okay? And the deal, as a result, is that we spend $94 billion more than, any other, than what we would pay based on the average of what other developed countries are putting in. So, the world's getting more competitive every day. Your ability to compete in that world. 
is restricted by the weight of debt that is being involuntarily placed on your shoulders. Can you imagine your prospects in a foot race and your opponent is wearing a tracksuit and you're wearing an overcoat? That's what we're dealing with. So <clears throat> your inexperience collectively, the, the, young of Amer the youth of America, and limited financial resources means that neither party, Republican or Democrat, feel a pressing need to address these issues which affect you. Lack of activism and engagement means that there are few who are effectively representing your interests. So what will you do after hearing this today? Be passive and accepting of this new generational theft that's going on? Or get organized and demand a seat at the table? It's your future. You make the decision. I'll end with one little joke of uh, a guy who's a very poor but deeply religious man. And every day he goes to church and he says, oh God, oh God, I'm a religious man. I pray to you every day. Let me win the lottery. Next day, same story. Nothing happens. Day after day after day. Finally, exhaustively, Lord, let me win the lottery. I'm a religious man. Thunder, lightning, the building shakes, and a voice comes down. Give me a break. Buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I'm asking you as a generation is to buy a ticket for yourselves. Thank you. Generally unhappy, 
Call me, you know. You know, I'll get your satisfaction. And somebody said, if I give this guy fifteen thousand dollars, he'll go away. This guy leaves five thousand dollars, you're wasting your time. That has to change. Another change. question. Thank you. All right. If, if you were king of the world, what are the three top things you do to change the tax code and the healthcare? Well, the tax code, as I mentioned, first thing I do is throw it out completely. Uh, get rid of all preferences. Uh, and if you wanted to use the tax, what we generally do is use the tax code to incentivize people to do things which we deem socially favorable. If you want to get a special tax for low-income housing or things like that, it's always cheaper to just write a check because otherwise the, the, the people who in, involve them, them do that because it saves them more in taxes than the cost would be to write the check. So just get rid of it and make direct payments for the things that you think are, are appropriate. As far as the healthcare system, I think inevitably we have to go to a single payer system, which is the way that most people, most of these other developed countries are, because it, it creates a, a unified negotiating party against the unified drugs, med, durable medical equipment, doctors, etc. Doesn't mean it has to be unfair, doesn't mean it has to be draconian, but it takes it. But if you look at the administrative costs of Medicare versus the administrative costs of private health, it's probably a quarter. It's just wasting money. Other questions? You talk about that a lot of the issues are structural and that we need to get a seat at the table if we want to stand up for rights. How do you advocate that though when it's this like I call it a, um, a circle that basically you know how do you how do you break that circle? Well, I think of instances when uh, you know youth or you know generally uh, underfunded, disempowered, people might have been more effective. My generation was very active during the Vietnamese War and were effective by being visible out in the streets, on the presence on the nightly news programs, and ultimately prevailed and ended that war. Uh, the youthful activism and enthusiasm of, of uh, electing a black president of the United States brought you, the use of social media brought President Obama to the White House. Um, I think the only way, you know, there's, there's an old expression, is that one of the greatest weaknesses of a democracy is its lack of capacity for sustained outrage. Sustained outrage. Because the news cycle keeps changing. Today is George Zimmerman, tomorrow it's something else, then it's a soccer stadium, blah, blah, blah. blah. And it's a, you have to be in their face constantly. You candidly need to be in the street. You need to be in the streets picketing the, uh, the sources of government that are uh, the source of this and have few articulate people, uh, articulate, articulated ideas that can be talked about. Term limits, rotating chairmanships of, uh, in, in Congress, a series of things of this nature which would be helpful. Limited. Occupy Wall Street died because it was everywhere. It was just a general disaffection. You talk about term limits on congressmen. Right now, they have a finite like limit. Okay, you're in office for four years. You can run again. You can run again. You can run again. So, but the only that's not that's not a limit. That's that's the right, right. I I understand that. So, but they write the laws that say how long they can, how many times they can run the same seat over and over again. They're not going to impose self-imposed restrictions on themselves. So, how do we get that to happen? By being in the street. I can't think of any other. I mean, the only way you're going to get that change is to get a, a, a you know, there was an old movie called Network uh, where the, the uh, newscaster said, I want you to get up and go to your window and open the window and stick your head out and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. That's basically what needs to happen on a continuous basis. Because you're absolutely right. The circle that I show you shows an entrenched, self perpetuating circle. So you have to break the circles. The only way you can change the circle is to make it the daily news. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, um, picketing and stuff like that, how would you go ahead and critique the Occupy Wall Street? As I said, I think they were very unfocused. 
Uh, they wanted, it was just a general disaffection. We don't like rich people, we don't like this or that. There was very little in terms of specific recommendations of what we need to do. All right? Right. So you, you, you need to get your ideas into a, a narrow focus, unify, have an articulate person, you know, no bomb thrower, just an articulate guy who's talking about this thing. Because, I mean, these are not, I'm not telling you things that you really, in your pit of your stomach, don't know or knew. It's just what's happening now is that more and more people, I mean, the, the 9 out of 10 people think Congress is doing a bad job. 90% of the people are uh, feel that gun control is an appropriate thing in this country, but we can't get it through. 90%. That's not a sustainable social system. This will not continue. I mean, I don't want to be alarmist. I just want to be a historian. There's a, a, a Scottish historian by the name of Tytler, T-Y-T-L-E-R, who talked about the Tytler cycle and said democracy inherently fails because citizens will constantly vote for the people who give the most until the system cannot carry it. It will be a collapse and it will be followed by tyranny. I give you a lot of historical examples for it. Either we get our act together or we're going to face social issues in this country. Mr. Rocker, the three main ways of changing the system being a rich donor, being a part of the system, or lobbying, all require a certain degree of seniority. So, um, in a country of lawyers and roles, what other venues might there be besides the street for us to affect the system? Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, no, as far as the lawyers, I, I can't. Uh, the lawyers have done very well. The only way that this, I think, is going to change peacefully, which I certainly earnestly encourage and hope for, is by having persistency, by being there in your face. By instead of going, you know, by encouraging people to, by educating people of, of, of the situation and getting people out there and talk to them. When you watch the politicians, you demand more. Everybody who runs for office says, I'm for cutting waste and creating equal opportunities and things like that. Who's for waste? It's meaningless. What specific wasteful things will you cut? Okay? They don't, people don't want to talk about that. Hold people to specifics. Get specific programs. I love it when I, when I see, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's not limited just to this. It's even local politics. It's like, we're going to have a stadium built for the Marlins at a cost of X to the city, and it'll bring $600 million to Miami. To you? No. The guy who owns the stadium, the guy who owns the, guy who owns the team, the hotel guys, the restaurant guy, are they being asked to pay the money? No. Well, if you are. You should, as I said in an earlier conversation, you should worship the ground that Norman Brayman walks on. He's buy your cars from him. He cares about the city. He loves the city. <laughs> Mr. Rocker, I wanted to ask you more on the terms of the students. What is one piece of advice you can give that you wish you had heard when you were a student? Very good question. Uh, take, be bold, take risks. Life is long. Um, I succeeded uh, in life by, I, you know, my greatest success came from taking improvements, not crazy and stuff. But be willing to sacrifice the near term for the longer term. Take a longer view, it's a longer answer than perhaps you learn. Um, I graduated business school, my human net worth was two or three thousand um, dollars. And uh, I had a job in a brokerage firm. I was doing nicely there. Uh, but I knew that I would not be able to build significant net worth by just multiplying this relatively modest amount. And so I took a position which would allow me to use whatever skill sets I had and abilities I had. Uh, to leverage that by using those skills with other people's money, taking a, a share of that for those efforts. To do that, uh, when a firm had recruited me to do that, I had to take a 30% salary cap. Uh, and I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a line from Julius Caesar in Shakespeare. There's, there's a tide in the affairs of men which taken at flood leads on to fame and fortune, omitted Life is forever in the shallows. Uh, that line, the benefit of the classics study, that line resonated with me. 
I decided if I was going to take a shot, you know, I have to live with the consequences. So take prudent risks, but take them. And that's what I'm encouraging. Thank, uh, thank you so much again for your time. And I am hearing a lot in my mind what, from what I hear is the word revolution. And coming peaceful, from, peaceful revolution. Yeah. <laughs> coming from Cuban immigrants and parents and grandparents that came from that and the outcome of that, it's kind of difficult to, to hear that word in this country. So I guess my question is, do you think that what will work to make these changes will come from someone like you or maybe your son or grandson who's coming from a wealthy, established environment? Or do you think it's going to have to be someone from the street who's and, and I would think that if it's someone from the street, it's not going to be a peaceful revolution. I, very candidly, I, I've lived in America for a long time. I've never harbored thoughts of, that there was a possibility of major social unrest here. It's going to have to. Because unless this is rectified, I'm fearful that it will in that direction because the inequities have grown too great. I don't think it's necessarily income-based. That's why I'm here. I think it's generational-based. I think it's it, it was a theme called intergenerational theft, where the older generation is taking from the young, and that's why I'm here today to try to you know to try to rally up, you know, to take the future in your hands, your future in your hands, and I don't think it need to be violent, but I think if, I don't think we don't I don't think we have time for my grandchildren to do this. It's going to be done well before that. I'm sorry if that sounds like a pessimistic thing, but that's just the reality. There's a drift here, and you can only tolerate a situation where 90% of the people don't like its government for so long. Thank so, you very much, David. We're very, very pleased.